Hello, my name is Andrew Ahn Westover, and I'm the key pairing director of education and public engagement at the New Museum. I join you today from the unceded land of Lenape people, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging and paying respect to Lenape people, elders, and ancestors, past, present, and future. On behalf of the New Museum, I am glad to welcome you to today's conversation between Okwi Akpakwasili and Massimiliano Gioni. This program is one of over a dozen artist conversations presented in conjunction with our current exhibition, Grief and Grievance, Art and Mourning in America. Programs like this are core to the New Museum's work of advancing new art and new ideas. I would particularly like to thank education and public engagement staff members, Andrea Calderes and Derek Wright, as well as the entire New Museum team for their help bringing this program together. New Museum public programs are generously supported by the Research and Residencies Council, and New Museum digital initiatives are supported by Hermione and David B. Heller. We also thank our members and supporters, like you, who help make these programs possible. Okuyakpakwasili creates performances that investigate the relationship between Western imaginations and Black bodies, often threading dance and choreography with historical and cultural memories. Her widely acclaimed experimental performances span dance, choreography, video, and installation, often designed in collaboration with Peter Bourne. Now, a few logistical notes before we begin. This program will last for approximately one hour. If you would like to ask a question, feel free to use the Q&A function at any time by clicking the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen to type your question. Please note that this program is being recorded, so your question will be recorded as well. If there is time, our speakers will answer questions during the Q&A at the end of the program. Finally, I encourage you to learn more about upcoming public programs and our full suite of exclusive digital content on our website, newmuseum.org. Now, without further ado, I turn the conversation over to the New Museum's Edless Neeson Artistic Director, Massimiliano Gioni. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Aqui. <clears throat> Welcome. So good to be here tonight with you. It's, um, uh, this is actually my last conversation in this series of conversations. So uh, oh. then, then we still have three more um, conversations on the occasion of this exhibition, but it's my last one personally. So it's really a pleasure to, to have it with you. And uh, I will start yeah. with a canonical question, which is, uh, if you can tell us how and when and if you met uh, Okwi Enwezor or, or uh, how you encountered his work. Yeah, well, um, first I want to say thank you for inviting me here and thank you to the whole New Museum staff for um, asking me to be a part of this conversation and this series. Um, I'm happy to be your finale. <laughs> um, uh, so I've never actually met Okwi Enwezor um, and I, the, and it, to this, to this day, it's kind of painful, you know. Um, what I did, though, is encounter him through the um, uh, his piece at uh, MoMA PS1, Africa, the Short Century. Um, and it was thrilling. And I think he just imprinted himself in my mind, in my sort of spirit, um, as someone who was framing a conversation that I had been looking to have, right? Um, as a, a, you know, a woman of Igbo heritage, this is my namesake, you know, the only time I've ever heard somebody else uh, uh, say Okwi, um, besides Okwi, hearing of Okwi and Wezor there in 2002, was in some um, market in Lagos when someone shouted Okwi, and it's just kind of amazing to just hear your name because Obviously, in this country, growing up in the '70s and '80s, I feel like you know you're so othered, you're so on some, you're on some edge um, of like a kind of um, social uh, uh, social category, right? Are you African? Are you African American? You know, what is it to be Igbo when you go to Nigeria um, versus Yoruba or you know Hausa? So there are so many um, sort of places that um, so many intersections. Um, that I feel like I'm always navigating. And it was wonderful to, first of all, see my name, to be the namesake of Okwi and Wezor, and to see that he was also navigating um, those liminal spaces, those uh, spaces of intersection diaspora, those kind of, those spaces um, 
of uh, identities that are being shaped and formed and complicated, um, to think about a contemporary art work, um, a contemporary practice that was happening, you know, through throughout the continent of Africa, and to to um, bring the complexity of those practices um, into onto the global stage or at least the Western stage. I just it was just mind it was mind blowing for me, mind blowing. And um, so so it's sad. It's sad. I never looked at his face, you know, in person. I never got to if he would have let me maybe touch touch his shoulder like what what would that have um i don't know maybe it's better this way maybe it's better that he be, is a myth for me you know yeah you know but the, he, yeah the interesting thing is um he he was definitely very much aware of your work and um while i don't know for sure if he saw your piece in the berlin biennale in 2018 he was definitely at that time that he told me he knew your work and that he was interested in uh, in including your work in this exhibition and uh, actually sadly the last time i saw him in person was the summer of 2018 and um, and then recently i asked his partner louise neri who i, I also want to thank because she's been incredibly generous and and helpful throughout the process of of this exhibition and i asked her um, you know do you know how Okwi and with or had heard or seen uh, Okwi's work, and uh, and she said, "Well, he was aware they had the same name, and of course she knew her." <laughs> and I think it's, uh, you know, when you told me that, I thought it was very, very sweet that you I both mean, had the same experience. And uh, but but I didn't have the imprint that he had. I mean, he just shattered my mind. You know, I thought, "Who? I've been waiting for this conversation, and he's been having it." He, you know. I hadn't seen Inca at that time either, but you know, but we have the same full name. Like it's not just Okwi, but it's Oku Chuku, which means, you know, some people would say either God's the word of God, God's word, or the will of God. Uh -huh. um, and so sometimes people have Oge Chuku, they have different um, you know, suffixes, there are different combinations, but we actually have the entire, the same, the full name. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so, so that that, yeah. that is faithful. But actually, I remember when he, he told me about the fact that he knew about the piece in Berlin, and and he, when he was working on the show, it was clear to him that uh, I think there were two things that were clear to him. One was that he knew how, to a certain level, you know tough or anyway somber in the show was going to be and he deliberately wanted to have uh, uh, the presence of sound and also live performance to counter the sense of uh, of stasis or or loss and uh, so i think actually originally as you know you know we we when we were even discussing uh, for your work to be more performative and that of course had to change in the light of the pandemic and so on but and then <clears throat> i remember he telling me and then also me telling when we had the first conversation how the piece in berlin uh, uh, which maybe you can tell us a little more about immediately connected to to notions of grief and grievance and um and so I don't know if you want to start from that piece or... Uh... Yeah, I mean, I, I think all of, you know, I feel like sitting on a man's head, poor people's TV room are also the spaces where I've been excavating particular practices of resistance and embodied protest of um, Nigerian women, particularly women from the southeastern region, Igbo women. And sitting on a man's head in Berlin, right, that piece was in some way my response to a practice called sitting on a man. Right, which is where women would come together and go into the private space, the compound of a man who had considerable, you know, power and privilege in the community, and they would do a durational performance, let's say a durational protest song, um, demanding that this person um, uh, 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 redress uh, their grievances, and um, they wouldn't leave until that person did. Right, and so that idea that you know people um like what is the length does this go for 12 hours 24 hours could it go for 48 hours right 
um, and the sense that, you know, what um, uh, sometimes they called also this movement that women, that the women did uh, for the women's war, which is when this practice also took place. There was something called the women's war. They called it the grand egwu, right? And egwu also means dance. And so even this idea of this durational protest practice um, is a kind of the fact that in the Igbo language, when they talked about it as an egwu and it, you know, that it's that that word means dance, the, the linking linguistically of dance and performance and protest to me was quite resonant. And of course, protest is, if we're thinking about visibility becoming seen and being heard, right? Um, there, it's, it's performative, right? And not in the sense of putting something on or faking, but the sense of um, creating some kind of urgency and um, shape and target and um, momentum, time, you know, somehow using um, what is powerful about performance to me, which is the ability to sort of impact the bodies of those around you, you know, taking your body to create a kind of um, 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 a bodily encounter and collision with somebody else to sort of wake them up, right? That's performance, right? And that's what happens in protest. And that's what I was thinking about with these women who were doing sitting on a man to do this durational sort of act of bodily collision in the private space of somebody with power and make them unable to resist your body, resist um, um, or turn away from what you're saying or what you're speaking to them. Um, that's, that's performance and it's protest. And um, it's, 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 I think, you know, to imagine what could that have been like for people to come together and just in some way to have this improvisate, this improvisatory act. Um, that's also, I just, what is that kind of the collective imagination and language that has to kind of keep forming and reforming to strengthen and, and make it even more powerful, the thing that you're saying. So sitting on a man's head in Germany was a space where I thought, if we're all going to come together and you know, we're in even more hybridized spaces. We don't all have the same languages, the same concerns. We don't always even know who do we address our concerns to, right? You know, I mean, whether it's a question of particularly in Europe, right, immigration um, or migration and, uh, you know, um, all of the people that are fleeing, you know, the Middle East and Africa, and as a result of some of the policies from these, you know, um, from Europe, England, the US, so they're, and colonialism, of course, they're fleeing and they're coming into this, this, so there are just multiple, I think, concerns. And I wanted to make a space to sort of, to see if we could, um, if we can make a space to hear what the multiple concerns of folks might be, right? Whether it's anything from being lonely, being um, missing your family that's not with you, to um, you know, just just wanting to be next to people, you know how. So the Berlin space of sitting on a man's head, so was not so much, you know, it was. Um, it was a way of shaping the ground for us to sort of think about how to be together and how to how to kind of come together with our multiple concerns, with our multiple um, our our multiple questions. Is there a space for a cry? Is there a space for laughter or just simple silence and contemplation? Right. So so yeah. So I was thinking about how do I make? Can I make a space that is before? or pre that moment of sitting on a man. It's pre like when it's like, okay, I know we know exactly what we're here to do and who we need to talk to to make a change. What is that space where we're, it's this atomized, these atomized um, bodies and concerns that come together to sort of start to find moments of connectivity and relation. And so in the space in Berlin, there was a, there was, um, there was a space of asking questions of people, artists um, who were, you know, I might be jumping ahead, but there were artists who were what I would call activators or they were the liaisons, right? And they would ask questions of guests or audience 
you know, what do you imagine happens to you when you die? You know, what do you carry with you? You know, um, what what is something that intimate that you've revealed to someone and they didn't believe you? How did how did that feel, right? And so sometimes artists were in the space to ask the questions. People would write answers to the questions in books or speak them to the artists. Um, and some go into the space, sometimes be with artists or go in by themselves. You know, they might whisper into a corner or speak in a corner. They might dance, they might sing something out loud. They might find themselves in a chorus with somebody. So that was, does that make sense? So there were, there were many, so that was, so I was sitting on a man's head in Berlin, right? So many things could happen, um, but really it was that, it was a space to hold all of the multiple ways that we are trying to find our connections to each other. Um, but then of course, Poor People's TV Room Solo was something that was much more directly um, thinking about the movement of uh, the Women's War in 1929 and was looking directly at some of the texts that came from the commissioned reports of the British government um, because over 50 women were killed over the course of three months in 1929. Um, uh, certain colonial uh, facilities were destroyed, burnt down, and the British government was like, why, why, what happened and why, you know? Um, and so they, uh, in, in, they created a commission and uh, I was looking through some of the reports and I took some of the language of the reports and created a durational, like a, a 50 minute song to sort of think about, you know, not, not to sort of, not to, to um, not for biographical purposes, but also to, for me to think about how to kind of resonate in the space that some of these women might, may have created, right? If they were together and doing sitting on a man, right? Um, but also, I do believe that that durational space, the performative durational space, is one where you can activate a portal, maybe open something up, right? <laughs> can I sort of, sort of like an epigenetic experience where I activate certain genes that are also, you know, speaking to ancestors in the past that, you know, then start to you know, they, 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 they start to resonate in my mind um, and in my body. And so, so that, that's that. Did, what's the, did you ask the, all of that? You know, there, yeah, talking, that was right? exactly the question. And, and maybe Derek, we can uh, see some of the images at the piece of the new museum. And I should also thank Derek, right, who's been- Yes, uh, Derek, thank uh, you. And see <laughs> or the hidden, since we're speaking of uh, ghostly presence, the hidden uh, producer together with Andrea and Andrew of this series of conversation. And so uh, to give some practical information, uh, Poor People's TV Room Solo, and correct me if I'm wrong, existed first as a, let's call it a theatrical performance, correct? And then uh, what, what was a, a particularly also exciting for me was to witness how we became um, a, a sort of standalone uh, uh, piece in the course of, of the, the conversations around this show, particularly also because this show got, uh, you know, in a sense, uh, got caught in the maelstrom of history through yes. COVID and, and then the protest and so on. So um, in a sense, you made the, a virtue out of necessity or, or much more than that and, and transform what was originally a performance into, I don't know how you describe it, a sculpture, an environment. Yes, I think all of those things. So Poor People's TV Room was actually a theatrical piece and it was inhabited by three other incredible performers and myself. But this was actually the first piece that I made and I am performing in it. I am the body singing the song in it. Poor People's TV Room solo. That was the first kind of bit of thinking and research and resonance and um, and so I had done this piece, but my body was inside of it in a couple of places. I, um, in the UK, uh, you know, in Canada, um, in Austria. But because of COVID and because of uh, the need, not, you know, because yes, the be, being caught in the maelstrom of history, 
we had to imagine me inhabiting that space but not inhabiting it right um and because in some way the piece does deal with the ghost presence then i also become a kind of ghost presence we figure that out and with my incredible collaborator peter Bourne, my partner i mean um you know i think together the solutions that we came to and his imagination around it is really it's it's it was just breathtaking um but you know i think that the sense also of the raffia sculpture which i think is also for me interesting because the video that you're seeing is happening um during the ofala uh, ofala festival this huge festival where the elders are being um uh, people are being inducted into a society of elders. My mother was also being given a chieftaincy title. It's a big titling ceremony. And so you have all of these incredible dance groups that are there um, to celebrate, to make some cash, but to commemorate and honor everybody. And so we had young women dancers, the older women dancers, but you had a number of the egungun, these sculptures, these masks figures, right? And And I know when I was there, and we were all, you know, Peter was filming then, my partner. And, you know, that was one of the times where I did start to think too that these Yeguns, these masquerades, were also a kind of portal and opening to some to the past, right? To an ancestor to, to ancestors, a way to a, a, you know, a way to encounter the ancestors. And so to have this kind of triple presence of the this Raffia, my body and then sort of the the residue the the emanation of my body is just kind of um this these many ghosts are is very um it it it, it yes it, it it we figured it out we figured out how how to be there in a live way and of course then there's the 50 minute song that's going throughout and that has its own insistence. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting, right? Because I think the live body in these museum spaces, I think it's a very complicated conversation um, because I'm always thinking are, you know, are spaces that are built for objects that, uh, material objects, um, how do they care for people who, um, or artist whose labor is not finished, right? Or who in the act, the, the, the producing um, the thing is the thing, right? Mm -hmm. The act of that, that labor is the, is the work. And um, so I'm always wondering about how to be taken care of in these kinds of spaces. Um, but yeah, somehow this piece, I feel like it continues to have the liveness and the insistence that we were working for. But then I'm also protected because I'm not, I don't have to be there. Yeah. Though I am going to be there, we are gonna do something. And, um... and I wanna ask you two things about what you just said. One is, uh, which obviously it's lost in the photographs is the sound and it's this song that as you say, lasts for 50 minutes. And if you can talk a little more about, you know, the lyrics and what you sing, and is it original lyrics? Is it found, or uh, you know, yeah. tell us a little more about that. And uh, and then I want to ask you, yes, also about the, you know, the meaning of gestures or, or the value of gestures, both as a as a choreographer and a dancer. And then when when those experiences enter, um, let's say the museum. And I think uh, your work together with a few other performers who have performed and worked in museums, I think they point to yes, to, to a question of the value of gestures and the value of bodies in um, in museums that I think it's uh, it's particularly relevant today. I mean, yes. Yeah. So, so um, the song, uh, <laughs> which is I'm going to dance on your head, right? Even though it's called Ogun Wanyu, but you know, this is an ongoing part of it is also this, I'm going to dance on your head, right? Um, part of his song is, is um, text that was taken directly from the commissioned reports that, you know, so, 
so technically taken from the mouths of the women who were answering to the British colonial government as to why they were protesting. Um, uh, but there were also things that I just loved, like a woman who refused to, she didn't want to, you know, they asked her to, you know, take her oath on the Bible, but she said, I won't take an oath on a Bible, but I'll take it on a sword, right? Mm -hmm. So obviously I incorporated in that, um, but I said, but I said, I can read, you know, I can't read your Bible. You know, I won't swear on a Bible. I can't read your Bible. Um, I will, you know, and then it was like, but I will swear on a sword. I can read your sword. I will swear on a sword. I can read your sword, right? So there is also that sense of sometimes starting with that language, but then my extrapolation and my, like in a way, the song becomes also my conversation with the women um, and, and the speech. But even that speech was mediated because many of the women didn't necessarily speak English, right? So there's an interpreter. So there's also, so the, there are layers of um, mediation that um, I have to accept and understand. And that's why I feel like I can take the liberty also to be in this conversation and extrapolate, right? Because also, then there's also my sense of they're missing. It's also my calling out to them, you know, look at this body boy, look at this body. I'm trying to have them. Um, it's yes, maybe in one sense, I'm asking you to look at, you know, my body as it's shifting and changing in that space. Um, but I'm also thinking about um, some of the practices that the women had, some of the embodied protest practices were to bear their breasts. You know, women of my age, uh, women, you know, childbearing and beyond age, when they bore their breasts in public, you knew that was another sign that you had done something um, to deeply uh, offend them. Um, um, if you have brought them to the point where they have to expose their, you know, their milk bearing breasts or breasts that have borne milk. Um, and, you know, because traditionally within Igbo culture, at least, young women did go bare chested, right? Um, but once you were married and had children, you would cover your, your breasts. Um, and so there's an interest, that interesting shift. But so here, look at this body boy is also a way of me thinking about, um, look at the body, like look at what my body might represent or what's inside of this body, but also um, a, a reference to the women who bore their breasts, childbearing, um, um, who, 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 sh who you, who were, who you, <laughs> this is going to be interesting. Okay. How do I say this? That you would bring them to a point that they had to shame themselves, right? Like the shame on you for forcing them to get to a point where, where they had to do, do something as shameful as bear their breasts. Um, mm -hmm. So, so this, so there was that conversation I'm having throughout the song and in the gestures and in the partially naked, my partially naked body. Um, but I think again, you know, <laughs> it's, this is a body now captured, right? And, and held, it's, it's possessed. And I think there's something in performance that resists that possession or the only possession is in the memory and it's slippery and uncertain, right? Um, but we know that in the context of museums, black bodies, African bodies, African bones, right, have been captured, taken, stolen, used, um, yeah, dispossessed, denatalized, just, you know, they're, they're, all of those concerns are layered, I feel like, within um, so they're layered within my experience of museums. And especially because if a museum's, if, the val if, if a cultural object's value is, um, is, is um, um, if the value of a culture, cultural object is that it doesn't change over time or that it's, it's preserved and, and uh, you know, it's unmoving, it's somehow, there's some way that it, it um, you know, it's the complete, it doesn't, it doesn't degrade in the way the human body degrades, right? It, it, it persists over time in a way bodies don't. It feels like, you know, 
inherently, of course I'm not, you know, a body in a museum doesn't have the value of these objects that can be held and shared and traded and, um, but I guess I don't want my body also to be within that particular economic um, construction, right? Sold, yes. traded. I mean, it's just so, pro it's, 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 um, it's complicated. But do you, but feel, I, yeah. uh, do you feel the context uh, of theater or performance uh, bypasses that problem or um, no yeah it's um, in some ways it does it's just because it because it's shifting and changing right in the context of theater and performance there's an acknowledgement that whatever you have is not the thing mm -hmm. whereas in all of these museums right it's the uh, the authentic thing is what to know that it's the authentic thing is what is um, what gives it value or something um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that, but in this case too, obviously I was part of the team that made this, right? So there is some power and I can have some distance from it and hope that it has some kind of almost destabilizing effect to the way museums create value. Maybe, maybe not, you know, but, um, I don't mean to suggest there's any one relationship to have that I have to what it means to operate in these spaces, but even simple things like, is the bathroom near where I'm going, to, where I'm going to perform? Like, what are the ways in which, you know, when my body is actually in the space or when collaborators of mine come into the space, how do I take care of their bodies? How does the museum think about how to care for degrading disintegrating bodies that have to do things that objects don't have to do right that have they have, they have weaknesses they have things they need to breathe or have water or go to the bathroom you know what i mean these are you know these seem to be very simple things but to to ask people to come into museums to ask performers and artists to do performance in museums and for museums to not consider that in their design it speaks to a particular feeling and idea about value, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I asked this question to a couple of artists in the series and uh, do you have an ideal museum where you think either you had a, a special um, experience as a viewer or, or where you think your work would exist uh, at its best. And I ask you ideal both, uh, you know, it can be a concrete museum that you visited that yeah. you particularly like or, or, or more of a matter of an aspirational model of what a museum should do um, mm. both to you as a viewer or to you as an artist. Mm. That's a very, very good question that I definitely can't answer because I think that I don't really Maybe the maybe that's a problem too. I don't know that I have ideal spaces. I don't, you know what I mean? Like, you know, the ideal museum might have to go up and then come down. You know, all of the walls might have to be movable. Um, do you know what I mean? Like it would have to have, the, the architecture would have to be so plastic in some way. Um, you know, I mean, like, I like the new museum. I love, you know, I, you know, I, but yeah, what would an ideal space, it just would have to be able to change, right? It would have to forego some of its monumental architecture. It would, but then, I don't know. I'll well, that's something that, that, that in, your, um, in your and Peter's work the, the, is a recurring element, which is this, um, the sheets, uh, the wall yes. that is not really a wall, no, that, that is both transparent and, and it's permeable. And, That's right. uh, and I know this piece was supposed to end with the plastic being torn. And remember, that was one of the <laughs> you were concerned that um, what, can we just leave it <laughs> right? Like we because the performance happens and then you tear down the plastic and it becomes this it's this, um, you know, tattered, tattered object broken in a way and yeah remember you were like well can we just leave it and yeah, let well, it be you know, I, I, it's... See it, <laughs> I see it so often and i you know to tell you the truth i i find that 
we are also lucky that all these um, events led us to such a mesmerizing thing, you know, it's, uh, yeah. and every yeah. time I see it, he has a fragility that is very special and, and yet also a resilience because it's not broken, because it's there, because he has this magic that repeats itself. You know, it's really like, a, I don't want to exaggerate with a kind of ectoplasmatic uh, references, <laughs> but it's a kind of magic lantern, no? There is, it's really right. a magic lantern with the, with the way that they, and you can see with people, you know, I have a great time every time I, I take people there or I look at people, there is something really mesmerizing about it that, um, that it's they are witnessing an event in front of their eyes, you know, and, and, and that goes to what you're saying about also the, you know, the object versus life in a sense. And uh, yes, it's an object, but you can tell by the way people react to it. It's, uh, it's happening in front of their eyes and they have this revelation. You know, for me, actually, when I think of museums, um, and it always strikes me, and it's actually a, a frightening thought. It, what I see if I, you know, don't think of styles, I don't think of history, I just see bodies and, uh, and gestures, you know? If I, mm. if I manage to abstract myself from what I've learned about history of art and so on, you go through it, it's just a parade of bodies and gestures, and it's also amazing to see how certain gestures return uh, across mm. latitudes and across. And so, you know, in a sense, a, an ideal museum for me is, um, yes, a museum of gestures. <laughs> and mm. and, and it, maybe because I'm Italian, I gesticulate a lot. But <laughs> it's, uh, no, I think, uh, you know. A like, lot what are some of the gestures? Yeah, that you. Well, return. if you, um, even if you go through the show, you know, I think there is this. Uh, photographs by Kerry Mae Weems with a group of people that are mourning. And I look at it literally every day and uh, I'm surprised, you know, these gestures of mourning are ancient as the world, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, there is a girl that is standing like that and another, and, um, and you start thinking, are people making that gesture because they learned from artworks or, uh, or artworks reflect those gestures because they are, you know, types that recur through centuries. And I think your work and, you know, other works like uh, Maria Sabi, many artists who have been doing choreography in museums, I think they, uh, they point to this uh, importance of gestures and, uh, and, um, and I don't even, you know, I wish I had something very smart to say about it, but it's this kind of tangle of affection and labor and uh, effort and um, and also effortless, you know, that that I think has something intimate to do with our experience of beauty and humanity, but I can't even really phrase it exactly. And, uh, uh, but I find all these things in your work and, and their work specifically. So it's been a nice uh, surprise. And, and I think he underscores something about the way museums construct value mm. um, that is uh, yeah quite refreshing in in the way that it does it so um, I want to ask you actually yeah. now something more about let's say your dramaturgical work you you, you became famous ah. <laughs> no you became somewhat famous let's say through Bronx Gothic which on many levels is also it's theater, but also literature. No, it's writing in a sense yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. and voice. And uh, and so I'm curious how you managed to go in and out of, let's say, writing literature and dance. Uh, and uh, um, I think it's a similar thing when you talk about like gesture, right? Is gesture something that is innate and comes out of us or is it something that's learned? And I feel that the two are entangled, right? There's no way they're constantly reinforcing each other. And I think for me, the practice of um, the gesture, the physical body and the language that comes out of the mouth, they're entangled dynamically, right? Um, so I try to set up conditions where I can find, you know, or I'll start to write and there's language in there and I, and I take some of that language and I start to think about gesture. And then I take space to just durationally, duration is a big part of the work. I will set up a, 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 a time frame for Peter and I will work on a sonic score. 
and I will just, I will work on maybe one gesture for an hour. And then something happens from that gesture that, that triggers a particular kind of language and conversation, right? So I feel like if I can spend time in one gesture, there is a whole world that emerges, um, not just even in more gestures, but a whole kind of psychic world and space. Um, and so I do try to set up a way to keep those things dynamically charging each other. Does that make sense? Yeah. You know. So do you do you write your choreographies? I mean, do you have a notation for the choreographies or? Uh, you know, I do, but it's not. It wouldn't help anybody. Like you know, wrong Gothic. I called it. It started out as the twerk gone wrong. There was the thirty minute, the thirty minute, uh, durational practice before the language, the spoken language, started. And I would refer to it as the twerk that went totally wrong. <laughs> and then it became the quake, right? Um, so that would be, that was my, I would, I have language notation. And then even within that notation, I have a scoring, you know, like it, you know, I might think about the whole piece with that. I thought of a prologue. Oh, I realized as I was doing that, oh, the quake is the, is is almost like a prologue, you know, in in an opera or musical, you know, you have or you you have the whole, you hear all of the musical motifs in the beginning, and then you have the. So for me, in some way, so I started to score even within the quake the kind of motifs of the whole piece, uh -huh. in that part, right? So there's you know there's a she's alone and then there's a kind of a fight that happens with some girls and then she turns and kind of encounters the audience um in a way that's looking at them but also understanding they're a kind of mirror mm -hmm. and as in and the end of the piece she is encountering herself through a kind of mirror and i saw i think maybe it's in the documentary or in another conversation around your work that I, I was actually quite surprised by how you you describe gothic as um, what is hiding in a sense. No, I don't know if I'm summarizing. Yes, it, yes. What's hidden. And, yes. So I want to ask you about, in a sense, visibility being clearly an interesting uh, question in your work, a recurring question, no? even in the piece we have in the show, this kind of it's visible, invisible, it's hidden, it's... Uh, yes. um, so I, I'm curious how these um, questions shape your work. Yes, when I think about the Gothic, you know, you also, I think first, you know, you think about the architecture, or I think about, you know, um, these, these, these places where there are these sort of hidden, these tunnels or these, these dark corners, or, and then thinking about Gothic literature, when I was reading it, a lot of it is epistolary narrative, right? They're letters. So Bronx Gothic starts out as actually an exchange of letters. Um, and also even that period where um, there was a sense of um, the body as a deeply dangerous, um, um, you know, the body and flesh as a kind of um, 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 this, uh, if, if you didn't control it or keep sort of your libidinal or discipline your libidinal urges, um, you could just find yourself in the fiery pit of your own passion and desire, right? And I think it also, all of that literature was happening at a time of the colonial expansion where maybe that darkness, um, which is sort of heightened maybe in Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, where that darkness was um, the kind of experience of the European facing themselves, but sort of projecting that self onto the bodies and, of, of, of black folk and, and people in the global South. So there are all of those, to me, that's, that's Gothic is in, entangled in all of that, mm -hmm. right? So Bronx Gothic for me, yes, you know, the shadows, the darkness, the hidden secrets, how to kind of, how to, um, how to kind of, manage or navigate the entanglement of violence and desire, right? That is 
you know, whether it's in the Western imagination, whether that is the particular um, problem of black women and black bodies as like our sort of history in this country with sexuality, we have been punished and disciplined and used. Um, um, we, you know, beasts of burden, um, you know, used to produce, you know, to, to like our, our sexual labor, um, you know, producing more, uh, yes, more product. Um, it's just, and also how we as women, as young girls have been over-sexualized. Um, there is violence against us that is not recognized. That's not that, that, um, um, yes, I, I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm starting to it's so it's it's also deeply entangled for me um, how complicated it is, I think, or I my experience of growing up as a black woman in this country um, and trying to kind of in some way uh, yeah, just in some way address and come to terms with like how to undo all of the ways that my body is supposed to be sort of a site of, uh, a site that is both dangerous, um, that is that is contaminated. I mean, you know, how do I almost reclaim, to try to reclaim my body, to reclaim in some way, um, I don't know, the just, I don't even want to say beauty, but just the kind of the natural and necessary um, like joy in in desire or I don't know. But um sorry, but yes, I'm gonna no, no, I think it's super uh, clear. And I think it's visible again, you know, the 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 kind of um the use of those diaphragms so that, that you are there, you're visible, but you're not exposed. And um, maybe they allude to that, you know, uh, ownership or, or to create a dispositive in which you're not, um, yeah, you're not consumed in a sense, or you're not um, easily appropriated. No, I think. Right, there's always some, some, there's always some kind of blocking some tension. Yeah. Uh, is there, and then maybe we can open a little bit the, the floor the, to the audience, but uh, is there anything you're working on now that, I don't know if you want to share, or that you feel that intersect with this piece, or or that this piece is leading you from or to? Yes, yes, I'm working on, I'm just thinking about black hair. I'm thinking about black girls and hair, and I'm thinking about the idea of hair as a root system that could you know, sort of connect you to the past, be a portal to the past, but maybe also to the future. But also, again, thinking about the body as a site and the Black woman's body, the Black girl's body, um, um, as a place where we can start to imagine differently, right? Where we can maybe undo, not undo, really, you can't undo it, but how do you kind of confront and address um, the, the painful, uh, distorted, um, violence, the, the, the violence that distorted your imaging of yourself um, and try to imagine moving forward differently, right? And so I'm just using hair because hair, Black women's hair is, has been uh, the contentious. The way we style it has been seen as it's, it's, it's outlaw territory, right? Like our natural state is, is some kind of, um, you know, something that this, the, 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 overarching state has to address our natural our bodily state is this kind of this this constant affront right to to powerful sources and so how do we um you know how do we just sort of either claim that our our bodies are constantly a space of resistance against a particular order um and figure out and and then start to shape a new order or a new idea I don't know. So I'm working on something around here. Okay, fantastic. So let's see if there are questions from the audience, the mysterious audience we sadly never see. 
face to face in these conversations. Hi, audience. <laughs> yeah, but it's so were... hard to me. It's hard for me to talk about all of this, and I feel like I have had to talk about it, but every time it feels different. Um, as I anyway, it's fine. Answer. It's just uh, I'm thinking the questions keep shifting and changing for me, and it's never enough. My explanations just don't. I don't know. Anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. You, on, a, on a practical level, do you make work? Um, and I ask you this because as a also as a performer, I'm, I, I don't know exactly how performers work, but do you make work mainly, let's say, on commission or you make work and then find opportunities to show it or to... I think it's, I make work, I just make work and then try to find opportunities or someone asks for a commission and it ha so happens I've been making something that I think will work. Mm -hmm. But I haven't, I have to say that it hasn't been, I haven't really, it's, it hasn't been the case where someone says, here's a commission and I've thought, oh, I haven't thought about that. No, there's something that I think I'm chasing and trying to figure out and it seems to fit. Mm -hmm. So let's see, there is a question about duration, how uh, performance, um, whether the term reflects the connection between the present moment of the performance and its connection to the ancestors or to the past. Mm -hmm. So I think the question is whether, you know, you mean durational in, let's say in the jargon of contemporary art, something that lasts a long time or mm -hmm. more interestingly, something that arcs back. Yes. Well, I think something that lasts a long time inevitably arcs back. Uh -huh. And so that's why I would think of it in the multiple ways. I would never think of duration in one way. I think of duration also as, yes, something that lasts a long time, but it lasts a long time. I mean, I'm not trying to say that it's instrumental only, but yes, it has, it, it serves a particular purpose which is to just to strip away, loosen up. I think even the sweat that happens in duration sort of layers and layers of skin that fall away and you start to get to some kind of essential thing. And I think whatever essential thing within, I think it kind of inevitably points back. Mm -hmm. Do you, I mean, in this work, there is a, a clear reference to, to Nigeria and colonial wars. Um, I don't think in Bronx Gothic there is any, let's say, Pan-African uh, myth, but do you feel... Uh, there's a song in Igbo, there's the Igbo, uh, there's a, an Igbo alphabet oh, is, well. is, 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 the, is the background for a song. It's my aunt doing the Igbo alphabet. And she refers to the mother, she refers in Bronx Gothic, there's a reference to the mother, a scary mother. Uh -huh. And you see her and... And so it's, the question is like, is this woman African? For me, yes. So it's always there. I think that there yeah. are these layers and threads that, you know, it, it, that are held in the work all of the time. Mm -hmm. But as maybe secrets and little, they're, they're threads. Um, but yes, yeah, so there is, there's actually Igbo language. Yeah, sorry, I, I, I... Nobody mean, probably knows that. Yeah. There is a, a very specific question about in the piece at the new museum, the the video and the girls and the women dancing, which I think you, you spoke about, but maybe yeah. if you can say a little more. And then there is a sequence with this firestorm or a house burning. Yes, the house burning down. And so what is it that footage? Um, so we know about the Igbo women and the, the, um, the young, the young girl group, they're there to honor all of the people that are being celebrated by the community and being given chieftaincy titles or being inducted into the society of elders called the Ichie. Um, and the footage, the fire footage, that's my husband. He put that in. And I, at first, so there's knowledge, there are really little clips of Nollywood footage. Um, and for, for me, the fire footage just, it makes sense. It makes sense. These women are not heard. Of course, this place is on fire, right? Um, so we have the celebration. Yes, right. We have the celebration. Um, 
And to me also, these ceremonies are very complicated because I feel like in some way they are also a nod to an ancestral past but most of these people, so many of them are Christian or, you know, there's a sense even in the village that if you practice ancestral uh, religions, that you're pagan, you know what I mean? You're on the margins, you're still on the outside. So for me, there is something that I feel, and also I'm, I'm quite, there are so many things that I'm ignorant of because I don't speak the Igbo language. I can say a couple of things like shut up or you know, I'll shut the door. If I hit you, you'll cry now. Um, just the useful things for parents <laughs> to teach their children. Um, but, you know, there is so much that, that I, I don't know. Um, but what I hear from my side of the family, even though when they get their titles, there's still a sense of they go to their Episcopalian or they go to their Anglican church, you know, and they don't, they don't do those those pagan rituals and ceremonies, you know. So there's to me something is lost. And so for me, that that house on fire, the thing that the women in 1929 were very concerned about, which is the existential um, threat that colonialism posed to their culture, their way of life, the connection to the ancestors, the loss of that connection. Um, in some ways, it failed. It's true. It, it's 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 but then it's some but I still think also this is the complication of sort of and the beauty to me of my Igbo culture in Nigeria like maybe it didn't fail it's just manifesting in a way that I haven't recognized yet too right um um but but the house on fire is 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 to me at like it's we're not settled yet we're not it's mm -hmm. not settled yet are these women seen yet, you know? Mm -hmm. And if if their only value is also within a Judeo-Christian framework, um, no longer in the powerful ties they have to the ancestors, no longer in their seeing capacity with cowrie shells, no longer in the stories that they, you know, pass down um, uh, to their children so that they can, you know, strengthen the bond of ancestors through the ages if that's not there, I, I don't know, or maybe it is, but the house on fire is, is to me, um, there is a structure, it is burning. Perhaps something might emerge from it. Maybe it won't be totally burnt, I don't know, but it's that, to me, it's this state of, you know, and obviously in Nigeria too, right now, it's very complicated. It's getting even more complicated, right? The North with Boko Haram. And, you know, I was starting to make this piece and think about this piece during the time when the 230 women, girls, yeah. or maybe almost 300 girls were stolen from the Chibok school. It was a time, you know, Black Lives Matter movement being led by this incredible contingent of women was also emerging here. Um, so that fire <laughs> is where it's the, the fire is here, right? It's not finished. So, so to me, yeah, like it's all of the, anyway. But. Well, there is a, not a question, more of a compliment that you and Okwi and Wizor are twins to me, uh. says the anonymous, the anonymous writer. And he, the, he or she was a, a graduate student of Okwi. And now uh, I study with you from afar and I, and, uh. I don't know if he or she wants to simply thank you for lighting yeah. the way. So <laughs> that's enough. Oh, that's very sweet, but don't put that on me because that man held <laughs> way too much. I can't even, this is very beautiful, but yes, no, he continues to be my teacher, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a real drag, right? Because I used to hope that maybe he saw the piece in Berlin, that maybe he actually was able to go inside of it. Like, know. you know, that maybe he, because the piece, Sometimes it was just quiet and silent and just there was there was a machine that we had devised so that the the plastic that film was moving in a way. So it was also a space of restoration. So there's a part of me that thinks that hopes maybe Okui went in there and stood and told a secret in a corner, making me think of the, you know, the Wong Kar Wai movie in the mood for love in the end. You know, there's a space in Angkor Wat where people would go and they would tell their secrets. You know, in some ways too, I feel like that space that we made in Berlin could be a place for you 
to go silently and tell a secret to, you know, out. Yeah. And so I, I, I'd like to think that maybe he did that. And ironically, or, or I mean, tragically, that piece opened in New York also, but uh, it was quickly shut down no? by, by COVID too, no? He, he oh, had a right. short we, did a, we did another Sitting on a Man's Head, yes, at Dance Space Project. Um, yes, and we were shut down. We had a couple of weeks because it's COVID. You can't, we were going in, you can't be so close to people, right? We were singing, yeah. screaming, laughing in that space. A lot of breathing on each other. <laughs> well, this is a, maybe a banal question, but obviously I have to ask you, you know, after also a whole year, how much uh, in your own, let's say, profession or all that has happened has changed the way you have to go about your work or, or even the way you think about your work? I'm still figuring that out. Yes, it's changed everything. I think we just did a piece at the High Line. The, for the first time, we were out in public but we were still masked and we have these sculptural head pieces. Like I said, we're thinking about hair and, and these pieces are kind of like hair from the future, you know? Um, um, they are very much a tribute to black hair and a West African threading style. And, um, and it's true, I'm, we're trying to figure out, yeah, we have to be right now, how do we capture things on film? How do we, you know, the opportunity right now is to be able to project a lot further and be in connection and conversation with people you may not have been, right? All over the world. Um, and to move out of spaces, like I talk about the plastic walls, maybe we already are there. You know, we've been making pieces on my rooftop, you know, uh, on the fire escape, you know what I mean? And so to really continue to open up where we think of performance or where to have a studio. Well, sadly, your, your plastic, in a sense, was prescient. You, you've seen the photos of, you know, this hugging uh, plastic. People, yes, in, yeah, yes. Yeah, hospitals and it's, um, yeah. It was so, it, yes, it's, it's just terribly painful to watch people trying to touch their loved ones. Yeah, we or people did. who died and the last thing you have is like the, the flesh to touch the flesh is like one of the few gifts if we can hold on to that as humans that we have like the energy and the charge and the nourishment of touch is like oof, it's fucking mind-blowing i don't know if it's a good place to stop or, or too depressing to stop <laughs> <laughs> A conversation from afar uh, uh, about the, the uh, meaning of touch. So, um, unless there are other questions, let's see. There is a comment that I don't know how to summarize in a question um, from uh, a performer or a performance artist who has been watching Bronx Gothic. And I think if I were to summarize it, it's about healing through space and time and I, whether you have any thought about that sorry sometimes these questions i summarize them and i yeah. sound like um a cheesy you know sentiment heart column in, yes, <laughs> in yes. but i think she or she's asking about yeah healing through space and time yeah um, yeah it's a concern of yours yeah i don't know that see the thing about bronx gothic is i wonder about it as a healing thing or as a place of occupying space and not being afraid to say and speak the thing that's happening, right? Because I think part of what, you know, a lot of protest movements are doing and need to do and do is it's to speak and say and say it again. You're killing us. You're killing us. We can't breathe. We can't breathe. And, and so perhaps that's healing, but it's also painful to say too, right? So maybe that's the, you know, how taking the space and the time to say what is happening to you out loud and without shame and fully like the women, you know, who would go into those compounds and compose songs right there and say, you're killing us. Stop doing this to us. Are you going to stop this? Stop it. You know, what is wrong with you? All of those things. So there must be a healing component in it, but I don't think about the healing. I just think about 
the saying. <laughs> yeah. Taking the shame out of the saying. Yeah, maybe the, the, the actually the one that need the healing are the ones to whom the words are directed. <laughs> you know, those maybe. are the ones that, those are the ones that need the fixing maybe. and the curing and the healing. Yes. Uh, not compassionately, the, the the you know. Yeah, they're not my concern, but no, yes, I, it's yeah. it's definitely to their benefit. Yeah, or maybe that's what needs to be repaired. You know, this idea that in a sense the the victim has to heal is also you know, maybe the victim doesn't have to heal. The victim has well, to... Well, we're not the ones that are... It's like, we're not the ones that are morally and spiritually broken. But, you yeah. know, like when the skin, you know, when we're bleeding out, someone needs to come and, you know, put the tourniquet on and staunch the bleeding, right? Um, but there is another kind of sickness and, and illness and death yeah. that, um, that the person who is doing the damage the person who is inflicting the damage yeah what's the you know they have to address it and their their death their death um is maybe um is is imminent in a way that they don't realize you know yeah but but it's true it's to their benefit it's to their benefit to some degree you know people who is the one that says i think james baldwin or other folks i'm not going to try to put, uh, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to paraphrase it, but you think about, um, what do they say? It's just like, you have to figure out why, why does the white person, if, if he is not the N word, right? Why is the, yeah. what is it in within the white person that creates the need for them? Why do they need to create, you know, this abject figure that mm -hmm. they, they violate? right like wh what is it within them that needs that and that's the sickness um yeah but yeah but that yeah yeah massimiliano thank you very much i'm sorry for my i'm so sorry for my windiness no no please, please this it. is uh, this is great and uh, i don't see other questions so i'll say thank you so much and i hope to see you in person and uh, uh, for once without plastic uh, yes. separations. <laughs> I know, I'm fully vaccinated. Are you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you see what the CDC came out with? Yeah, yeah. So, well, so, thank you so okay. much. And thank you to everybody thank at you. home, as they say, or wherever they are. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.